Good evening, everyone. How is everyone? Thank you for. Oh, oh, there we go. Okay. Thank you for joining us tonight. Welcome to the Kennedy Center Eisenhower Theater for this evening's Millennium Stage presentation, brought to you by the Centene Charitable Foundation, with major support provided by Target and the Marriott Foundation. As a courtesy to tonight's performers and other audience members, please take a moment to silence your mobile device. Every day, the Millennium Stage celebrates the human spirit by presenting a free performance at 6 p.m., 365 days a year, 366 this year. Um, performances are broadcast live and available on demand at kendi-center.org to make the arts as accessible as possible. And now, please enjoy Beyonce Mass. Jesus said, where two or three are gathered in my name, I am there among them. It doesn't matter the space or the place. It does not matter what you are wearing or how you talk, because you have brought all of who you are into this space, your joys and your concerns, your trials and triumphs. Jesus is here among us, and we are the church. I don't care where you came from. I want you to clap, dance, sing, shout, because this is how we worship God. Now that you're out of my life, I'm so much better. Not that I'll be weak without you, but I'm stronger. Not that I'll be broke without you, but I'm richer. Not that I'll Without you, I'll have power. Thought I wouldn't grow without you. Now I'm wiser. Thought I would be helpless without you, but I'm smarter. Thought I would be stronger. 
children and lots of happiness. I'm better than that. I'm not gonna blast you on the radio. I'm better than that. I'm not gonna lie to you and your family. I'm better than that. I'm not gonna hate you in a magazine. I'm better than that. I'm not gonna compromise my Christianity. I'm better than that. You know I'm not gonna miss you on the internet. Cause my mama told me better than that. I'm a survivor. I'm not gonna give up. I'm not gonna stop. I'm gonna work. Welcome, welcome to the Beyonce Mass. I am Reverend Yolanda Norton. I'm so glad to be with you here this evening. We want to welcome you to this Christian worship experience. This is womanist worship. This is, this is worship. No, that's right. We like that energy. Come on, keep it live. This is womanist worship, a worship that privileges, understands the realities, the stories, the struggles of black women. As I said, I don't know what it took for you to be here today, but we are so glad that you are here. If you have never felt seen before, know that we see you. If you have never felt loved before, know that we love you. If you have never felt like you were a part of something, you are a part of something here. And it's not because of anything that any of us has done. This is the love of God. Amen. I don't know what your vision of the church is, but we have decided that no matter your race, your age, your gender, no matter who you love, Amen. you are the thing that God had in mind when she looked out over the world Amen. and said, it is good. Amen. So we don't do Frozen Chosen here. This is not your grandma's church. Sing as loud as you can. Dance, clap, love, live, understand this worship. You are welcome here. You may be seated. If you would pray with me. God, who is giver of life and source of boundless hope, it is with your spirit of justice and mercy that you have called us here tonight. We are far from perfect, but moved by your vision for unity and compassion, we have heard your call. So in this place, we will praise and worship. We will pray and profess, shout and cry. We will do the work of liberation and love, confession and testimony. And in this labor, we ask that you would free us, that we may fearlessly draw near to your calling to dismantle systems of power, privilege, and prejudice. So tell me your secrets I just can't stand to see you leaving Heaven couldn't wait for you Heaven couldn't wait for you Heaven couldn't Good wait for you. So come. 
darkness, so scared that we lost it. We stood on the ceiling. You showed me love was all you needed. Dangerfield. Sandra Bland. A Tatiana Jefferson. Raynette Taylor. Turner. Janaya McMillan. Laylene Kubalet Polanco. Zoe Spears. Tyra Hunter. Kendra Chapman. Islan Nettles. Lavina Johnson. Marielle Franco. Rakaya Boyd. Sadie Roberts Joseph. Tamika Washington. God, we lift these names up to you, for they were the gifts that you gave to this world that we could not hold. Forgive us the sins of hatred and apathy, ignorance and disdain. We know that with you they have found their peace. Lord, we pray that we have the fortitude to create a better world, a world that honors the dignity of all life. Amen.
Yeah, the thing that says we're fighting for in this world is self-love and your own contentment within yourself. I believe what's worth fighting for in this world is liberation. It's uh, love. Peace is worth fighting for. You know, you have to find peace within first to seek peace without. It is worth fighting for peace, love, and your dreams. I think it's worth fighting for different stories to be heard, um, for safe spaces in which those different stories can be spoken. When you love something, uh, it is everything to you. So many times we get into a point where people tell us, no, that's not possible. And I wanna be the person that helps to disrupt those no's. footprints on the sands of time No, there was something that I left behind When I leave this world I'll leave no regret There's something to remember So they won't forget I was here African-American females to be a national coach, um, to be a part of uh, things that were not traditionally in our space. But I want to be remembered as a person who might have been the first, but I'm not the last. I want people to know that I created new pathways for them, for black women in underrepresented fields. I want them to know that I was a go-getter and pushed everyone around me to get their dreams, get what they aspire. I want my legacy to encapsulate community. I would like to be remembered for advocating for those who feel they don't really have a voice.
hear these words from the book of Esther. When Mordecai learned all that had been done, he tore his clothes and put on sackcloth and ashes and went through the city wailing with a loud and bitter cry. He went up to the entrance of the king's gate, for no one might enter the king's gate clothed with sackcloth. In every province, wherever the king's command and his decree came, there was great mourning among the Jews with fasting and weeping and lamenting, and most of them lay in sackcloth and ashes. When Esther's maids and her eunuchs came and told her, the queen was deeply distressed. She sent garments to clothe Mordecai so that he might take off his sackcloth, but he would not accept them. Then Esther called to Hatak, one of the king's eunuchs, who had been appointed to attend to her, and ordered him to go to Mordecai to learn what was happening and why. When he went out to Mordecai in the open square of the city in front of the king's gate, and Mordecai told him all that had happened to him and the exact sum of money that Haman had promised to pay into the king's treasury for the destruction of the Jews, Mordecai also gave him a copy of the written decree issued in Susa for their destruction, that he might show it to Esther, explain it to her, and charge her to go to the king to make supplication to him and entreat him for her people. Hatak went and told Esther what Mordecai had said. And then Esther spoke to him and gave him a message for Mordecai saying, all the king's servants and the people of the king's province know that if any man or woman goes to the king inside the inner court without being called, there is but one law. All alike are to be put to death. Only, only if the king holds out the golden scepter to someone may that person live. I myself have not been called into the king's house for 30 days. When Mordecai, when they told Mordecai what Esther had said, Mordecai told them to reply to Esther, do not think that in the king's palace you will escape any more than all the other Jews. For if you keep silence, at, for, at such a time as this, relief and deliverance will rise for the Jews from another quarter, but you and your father's family will perish. Who knows? Perhaps you have come to royal dignity for such a time as this. Pray with me. God, we pray right now that as I stand at this, your sacred desk, that you might allow a word to go forward, not from me, but from you. A word that can fix some, heals some, energizes others. A word that will allow none of us to leave here the way that we came. I ask that I would decrease and you would increase and your spirit be made manifest in this place. And all of God's people said, amen. <clears throat> Y'all, I'm tired. <laughs> I'm tired of talking about love in the face of people who are filled with hate. I'm, I'm tired. I'm tired of turning on the television and seeing the blood of black bodies running in the street. I'm, I'm tired. I'm, Tired of brown be people being turned away at borders that welcome white folks. I'm tired. I'm tired of being ignored. Tired of people trying to appropriate my identity. I'm tired of people calling me an angry black woman as if I don't have the right to be angry. I'm tired. I'm tired of well-intentioned white folks, tired of divisive Christians, tired of stupid political and religious debates that try to regulate people's bodies and who they love. I'm tired. Yeah. I want to, I promise you, I want to believe Theodore Parker when he said, we cannot understand the moral universe. The arc is the long one, and our eyes reach but a little way. We can't calculate and complete the figure by the experience of sight, but we can divine it by conscience, and we surely know that it bends towards justice. I'm, 
I'm tired, but I want to believe, like Dr. King believed, that the arc of the universe is long, but it is bent towards justice. I want to. But in the words of my foremother, Fannie Lou Hamer, I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired. <laughs> there are days, there are days when I want to sit in my house, count my losses, lick my wounds, and lament. There are days when I want to walk into the street with my black power t-shirt and my fists in the air screaming at folks, say it loud, I'm black and I'm proud. Some days, some days, if I'm being honest, I want to burn it all down. And if I'm really being honest, there are some days I want to enjoy what little privilege and comfort I do have and pretend that the world is not crumbling around us. I know, I know, I know. Y'all are more enlightened than I am, more long-suffering than me, but I I'm tired, and I have to wonder if that's how Esther felt in this story. She was a long way from Judah, having lost her family, been exploited for her beauty. She had gotten her little piece of the pie, and maybe, y'all, she was just tired. And yet, despite all the ways that we might get tired in this life, God is calling us to be agents of peace, justice, and deliverance in this world. No matter what you think you've got, no matter where you think you have arrived, no matter how much money is in your pocket, how cute you look when you walk down the street, no matter how much Prada Gucci you have on your person, we are being called for such a time as this. I have to believe that the God that we serve is a God who intends for deliverance to come from somewhere. The question is, will you participate in the deliverance? So what do we do? What do we do when the world is falling in all around us, when people seem determined to hate one another, when we seem immune to the hurt, the pain, and the suffering of the people who are all around us. Maybe there's something to be learned from Esther. I promise you, I won't be here long, but I want to suggest to you that the first thing that we have to do in times such as this, if we want to see God's deliverance come, is we have to watch. What do you mean, preacher? It's too easy for us to sit in our enclaves and talk about justice, theorize about peace and reconciliation. We've become voyeurs searching for highs and good feels when we talk about love. We're more than willing to send checks, but never willing to touch people. We have to watch, we have to pay attention, not just on the news, not just when it feels good, not just when it's someone else's racism, sexism, heteroaggression. We have to be willing to watch ourselves, examine our motives and attentions, and dissect the ways that we participate in the oppression of our brothers and sisters. We have to watch what's happening in the world around us, and we have to be willing to watch ourselves. It's easy when you are the one who is experiencing racism, to talk about somebody else's problems and their isms. But it is a church that will talk about racism but won't talk about heteroaggression. Right. Let me help somebody. Everybody keeps asking me what this word heteroaggression means. I don't use homophobic. You aren't afraid of anything. You're hateful. It's heteroaggression. We don't have to talk about xenophobia. You're not afraid of foreigners. You're being spiteful. We have to learn that there is more that brings us together than pulls us apart. All you have to do is look around you. God intends for us to see one another in this world. 
we have to be watchful. And when we are done watching, the next thing we have to do is pray. We have a problem with prayer. I have to say that it confused me when I read this text because I was looking for the prayer. Life is hard for Judah. People are dying all around them. People are mourning. And what confused me about the Esther story is that it seemed a peculiar reality that when God's people had their lives on the line, that nowhere in this story is the name or presence of God mentioned. No one's talking about God. No one's talking to God. There's no mention of the temple, no talk of the priests. No one is offering of sacrifice. And it was my first mistake. My first mistake was to believe that because God and the temple were not mentioned, that God was not present. Let me help you. I want to suggest to you that in this world in which we live, that we might take a cue from the writers of this book and understand that just because God is not mentioned does not mean that God is not present. There are too many people in this world who know just the right things to say when they walk in the church. Know the right scripture to read, know the right way to give the doxology, but don't know how to live for God or demonstrate God's love in this world. And I know just enough people who don't set foot in church on Sunday, don't know the words to speak, but everything that they do mirrors a God who lives in this world for the sake of beloved community. I am persuaded that we have to unlink God talk and God walk. We have to acknowledge that everyone who talks about God is not doing God's work that it's more important that we demonstrate God's presence in this world than we pun that it is that we pontificate on God's presence. <laughs> you don't have to talk about the church to be the church. So, what do you, so the best prayer that we have as God's people is with our feet. Yes. We have to be willing to get out of our comfort zone, move out of our homes, get off your street, get out of your neighborhood, leave your city, get out of this country and do something that, that shows that God is a God who lives all over the world, is not concerned about the things that divide us. God is God who is concerned with bringing us all together. If we are going to be the church, we have to stop holding on to doctrine that make people feel like they are, less, they are less than what God has created them to be. We have to pray with our feet and our movement and understand that God has intended a better world than the world around us. Beloved, I know that it seems like there has been a decree issued on too many of our lives. We have buried too many folks, sent so many folks on to glory, and I know you feel like mourning, but today we put a pause on mourning and we rejoice because today we war. Today we do battle. How are we going to be, do battle? We are going to do battle because we are going to link arms. We are going to stand in the face of every person who tries to snuff out another person's life and say, not today. We are going to be a people who fight for justice and peace. We are going to rejoice in the life that God has created in our brothers and our sisters and our siblings and our kin. We fight with love. We fight because we speak death or we speak life where other people choose to speak death. This is God's vision for us as a people, that no matter what land we are in, no matter what name you call him, God's presence is with us and it intends for us to live and not die. Beloved, go into the world and live love and remind the people 
you were here because you were created for such a time as this. We are called to the prophetic task of destroying all things that do not honor the dignity of life here on earth. For the work of God requires that we make communal provision for the body. This is the great exchange, to lay down the burdens of the body burdens of hatred and division, the weight of exclusion and apathy, the sickness of poverty and punishment. It does not require that we be perfect, but prayerful. It does not require that we be flawless, but faithful. So here, we ask that you enter into a posture of prayer. We have ushers in the aisle, we ask that you would follow their directions. When you came in, you were given a rock. Lay the rock in the buckets. Lay down the weight of our human failure and walk away with the grace of God. And as you prepare, hear this prayer. I'm a train wreck in the morning I'm a bitch in the afternoon Every now and then without warning I can be really mean towards you I'm a puzzle, yes, indeed. Every complex in every way. And all the pieces aren't even in the box. And yet, you see the picture clear as day. Don't know why you love.
left these rocks here, we pray that you would put down all of the hatred that is weighing this world down and live in a spirit of grace and mercy and love. Join us as we pray this womanist Lord's Prayer. Our mother, who is in heaven and within us, we call upon your names. Your wisdom come, your will be done in and all the spaces in which you dwell. Give us each day sustenance and perseverance. Remind us of our limits as we give grace to the limits of others. Separate us from the temptation of an empire, but deliver us into community. For you are the dwelling place within us, the empowerment around us, and the celebration among us, now and forever. Amen.
So we are preparing for the end of this worship service, but I have to say this is work that I love, that gives me life. I am grateful for all of you who have come to worship with us this evening. And I have to give thanks to all of the people who helped to make this happen. So if you would join me in giving a round of applause for the Kennedy Center, for the National Capitol Presbytery, the PCUSA, give it up for this band, the power of song. Come on, DMV Beyonce Mass Choir. September Penn. These wonderful women who are the soundtrack of my soul, the Black Girl Magic Ensemble. To Ashley Reed, Denise Diab, Andy Deeb, the Beyonce Mass Core team, they have been with me from the beginning. And y'all, the thing about being home, and I am home in the DMV, is that I get to be reminded of the village and the tribe who got me here. There is no reason why this little black country girl should be standing in front of you at the Kennedy Center. If it was not for the people who loved on me early in my ministry, in the young years of my life, I would not have made it here. So to all of my friends who have become family, I love you and I thank you for all the ways that you hold me from day to day. Thank you all. So... 
am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present or things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth can separate us from the love of God through Christ Jesus. We have broken enough in this world. We have done enough harm and damage, but I believe through Christ Jesus that we can start over, go into the world and do the good thing that God is calling us to. Go in peace and go with God. Let's start.